G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Today we've got B-Dub on and we're talking some ADP data from the Fantasy Basketball International Squad. Let's go! talking about practice. LeBron James with no regard for human life. And he's going to Back out to Allen. His three-pointer. Hurry for three. Wow! Unbelievable. Making it rain in New York. We the North are now we the champions. Not the destination. G'day and welcome again to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey, and you can find me on Twitter at Ball Boys NBA and on Instagram at Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball. Today, I am joined by a very uh, special guest, um, someone whose opinion I respect very much. So, uh, B-Dub from Fantasy Basketball International. How are you, man? Good, mate. Thanks for inviting me on. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on, and um, I've I've been enjoying uh, your content with yourself and Matt uh, from afar, and um, thought we'd uh, we'd get you on and, and gain some insights uh, from all of the stuff that you do over at Fantasy Basketball International. Um, we're going to be talking about some ADP data that you've generated from a lot of the leagues that you guys run over there, um, which is probably I mean I'll let you have it uh, talk about it in a second, but it's probably maybe a better indication of a a more serious league, a bit more um, people with a bit more investment than perhaps the rankings on a Yahoo or the ADP on a Yahoo itself when people are kind of just signing up and leaving halfway through. Um, So that's going to be the focus of today's uh, podcast. But I'll I'll throw it over to you before we get stuck into it and just let us know a little bit about Fantasy Basketball International and what you guys do and how these numbers have kind of been generated for us to discuss today. Yeah, no worries. Um, all right, so yeah, Fantasy Basketball International is it's basically a hub for leagues, and we've recently started producing uh, content as well. Um, so that's a, a blog, uh, a podcast, uh, and so on. Uh, bringing on Adam King um, onto our team uh, to help facilitate a lot of that. Um, but yeah, we're running like every type of fantasy league basically that you can think of. Uh, and these ADPs are actually generated from our draft only leagues. So pretty much when the when the last season finishes, I start firing up uh, draft onlys for the for the next season. Um, we do uh, have kind of a closed user group. It's typically you know fantasy nuts that are sticking around during the off season, people that are really invested in it. Um, so yeah, to your point before the. It's, it's good drafters that are drafting in all of these leagues. Um, you know, it starts off, I'm running maybe one or two a week. And then as we get closer to the start of the season, you know, dropping five or 10 draft only leagues at a time and they get snapped up pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, the quality of the data uh, is typically much better than what you'd find on Yahoo, ESPN or, or fan tracks simply because, uh, you know, the, the, the people in it are a quality standard. And I believe um, there's like a, a small sort of monetary value attached to it as well. So people are, you know, they've got a little bit more investment rather than just, sort of, oh, yeah, it's a mock. I'll just take this guy here, which I know um, sometimes can throw off the data. I know on our show, we we don't use ADP data very much when it comes to um, talking about sleepers and busts and things like that. I, I, I do go more off the rankings on a Yahoo site because I feel like that dictates... Um, at least for the the more casual fantasy uh, participant, um, their rankings and things like that a bit more than like ADP data because that kind of follows that. Uh, you always get people who sign up to those mock drafts on Yahoo or an ESPN or whatever and leave halfway through and half their team ends up being an auto draft. So that's a reason why if you're listening to the podcast, you haven't uh, hear me talk about ADP data that that much before, but I think this is a, a more reliable and credible resource for us to use. So let's um, let's get stuck into it. We've got we've got a lot of guys that I want to get through today. Um, I do want to just go through um, a few guys in the first round. I want to start with uh, Luka Doncic um, with the data that you've present, presented us. His ADP. Now I believe this is on about twenty six drafts that have happened so far in the preseason. Um, so his Luca's uh, data is at three point nine six. So basically, going at pick four, maybe slightly above in some situations, he was the third highest um, 
guy on the on the list here. What are your thoughts on Luca this season, and and do you have any information or, or feedback to provide us whether he's going up or down, or is pretty steady around that top part of the first round? Yeah, uh, so Luca Luke is always a popular choice uh, for drafters, uh, simply because they like to have him yep. on their team, and that goes more so for your casual uh, user or your casual league participant. Um, but it even applies to analysts and stuff like that as well, all the way through the spectrum. Um, so I know Adam, you know, if he's yeah. trying to choose between one uh, one player or another, he's typically going to go with the one that he thinks is going to be more fun to watch. Yeah. Um, so Luke has always had like a, uh, a higher ADP. He always gets taken kind of higher up boards than maybe the data would suggest. People are just, you know, uh, expecting upside from him. Um He's actually fallen down a little bit since from where we started. He was kind of getting taken uh, second or third overall, sometimes even in first uh, ahead of Jokic on a couple of occasions, um, as strange as that sounds. Really? Yeah. Uh, a lot of that was probably generated off the buzz of Dallas making it through to the, to the conference finals. Yep. Um, so at four, he's actually just come down a fraction as people are starting to zone in and thinking about, oh, I want to win my league. Yeah, yeah, I think... Look, I think he's always a guy that is going to get fairly hyped. I mean, there is there is a case to be made. I think he's probably, you know, the a top half of the first round, especially, and, and I should mention that this starter is based on head-to-head leagues um, and nine categories. So um, in a head-to-head league, I can definitely see the argument when you punt the free throws, you punt the turnovers. Um, he's definitely someone who is really valuable in that build. And and I would have him around that sort of five, six mark. So it's not far off the mark. I just thought it was an interesting one to, to sort of mention uh, because he is a very popular player. The name value carries a lot of weight. Um, in saying that, he's ranked nine on Yahoo!, um, Again, in a Roto League, maybe you push him down the board a little bit, especially a nine-cat Roto because of those turnovers and percentages. But uh, I, think it's, I think it's fine at this, uh, at this sort of a spot. To continue on with the first round, I did something that really did catch my eye and it sort of um, improves or, or, or further cements my opinion of I don't want to be drafting in the middle of the first round if I can avoid it uh, with a standard 12-team league is there's a huge clump of players between um, 6.65, which is Kevin Durant, and 8.65, which is LaMelo Ball. So you've got about, how many players is that? Six players within two ADP positions of each other, which sort of tells me that there's no consensus um, within that first round between that kind of a range. What's your, do you have like a similar kind of takeaway and, and how would you sort of um, rank these players if we're going through the guys that are on that list? Yeah, uh, well, I guess, yeah, the top, the top few picks are, uh, are pretty set in stone. Um, after that, I know that there's kind of a lot of um, chatter about not wanting to, you know, be drafting kind of in that, you know, four to nine range. I think the back end of that range actually isn't too bad. Yeah. Um, yeah because you're essentially just taking the, 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 the person from that group or the player from that group that falls to you. Um, I'm finding that like, that's often like James Harden, for instance. So yeah. if I'm getting him at eight or nine, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Um, in terms of where I would kind of place those players, uh, it's interesting. Um, to a certain degree with this top 12, uh, I know that it's difficult to project injuries, but it, that calculus does come into your mind quite yeah. a lot with these players um, because, you know, there's not that much separating them and you, at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're going to look for different factors to, to make that delineation and then that's often going to be like health. So mm, going through that list, personally, I think Steph is the biggest health risk um, there. Even really? Though, yeah. Even though Durant's got, um, you know, a history of injuries and he, and he constantly misses time. Um, I don't know. I think he's, uh, yeah, I, I don't see Durant as a bigger health risk as Steph. Um, I think Steph's missed time, considerable time uh, across the, the last few seasons. And I also think he... Uh, he gets a little, uh, hmm, not overvalued, but people kind of buy into, uh, you know, recent playoff success a little bit. So uh, I kind of push Steph a little bit down. So I never really end up with having him on my team. Uh, and I guess out of that group, you know, it's really Tatum and LaMelo that I'm pushing up. Maybe it's because they're younger. 
Um, but they do seem more durable to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think um, I, I have a similar kind of opinion. I think that it's it is hard to project injuries, but like you said, when these guys are really close. You do want to feel safe with the first guy you pick, and you want to have someone that you feel like you can build a good base around. Um, a lot of the principles that I discuss on our podcast is like team building. So for me, it doesn't really matter who you select. I mean, you don't want to select someone stupid like OG and Obi the first round, first round pick, but you want to you want to get a guy that you're happy with to build around. You, Maybe you want someone you can get a really clear direction, um, which is why for me, Giannis is a clear number two pick for me. It's an easy punt free throw strategy. Um, and then, and then from there, you can start to sort of build your team from the, from that point. Um, if, if you don't feel comfortable taking Kevin Durant at pick four or pick five and you'd rather a safer pick than Jason Tatum, I don't think there's anything really wrong with that. Like, yeah, maybe Durant might get you a few more blocks than Tatum, but whatever. Like, if you punt that category, it it really reduces the difference between those guys on a per, per value basis. Um, so I think it's just interesting to me that there isn't a general consensus on that group of players. And I agree with you. If I can select at pick nine and I can get whoever these guys fall to me and, and I don't really have to make that decision. I go, okay, cool. This is the guy I've got. Like if Lamelo Ball was reaching me at nine or 10, um, giddy up, let's go. Um, I'm really happy with that. Whereas if I'm picking at like five or six and I have to make the decision, I feel like I'm always going to be a bit uh, like flipping a coin kind of thing. And, and that's the kind of stuff that you can kind of drive yourself mad um, overthinking. So my, my thing would be just pick the guy that you like, pick the guy you feel comfortable with. And then after that, then the real decisions start to make sense, especially in a head-to-head league when you're, you're picking out your punt strategies and who comes back to you on the second round. Um, let's move into that second round, and I want to talk about... There's a couple of guys going in opposite directions. The first guy I want to talk about, who is always a big topic of discussion, um, Kyrie Irving. The ADP here you've got listed in from the um, uh, FBI leagues is at 18.27. Um, for me... I believe that that's... I mean, it's not surprising. I would be comfortable taking him anywhere in the f- second round as long as you're feeling pretty comfortable with your first round pick. What What are your personal thoughts on, on Kyrie? And, and where do you see... Uh, has he been moving up or down? Or, or what's his direction been like with that ADP data? Yeah, well, Kyrie's an odd one, as we all know. Yeah. But he's also odd in the context of these draft only. He's... he's you know, in the in the top echelons, the top couple of rounds, there's not really that much divergence between where players get drafted. You know, like maybe Tatum's getting a high of six and a low of yep. nine or ten. Yeah. But with Kyrie, it's like high of eleven and low of thirty yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So it really just depends on the mix of drafters that are in the room and how risk averse they are. Like Kyrie's really kind of destroyed his uh, like any reputation that he might have had for being uh, producing consistently throughout a whole season. Yep. Um, I think a lot of that or some of that is a little bit overblown. Like last season, for instance, yeah, he's missing a lot of time, but that was a, you know, a, an issue around, you know, his, his vaccination status rather yep. than yep. like being a, like an injury of any kind. And I don't think that uh, we're going to be looking at the same kind of restrictions moving forward with, with that particular issue. Yeah. So, just just yeah. Toronto. I think he, I think he's still not allowed to play in Toronto. Yeah. Well, um, what did that be? One or two games? Two games. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Ross not not a big concern. Yeah, well, the, the concern there will be when they're in a playoff series together. Um, yeah. But anyways, uh, but yeah, Kyrie is widely divergent. And I think the the smart way to think about that is like after a certain point, he's just representing too much value yeah. for you not to take, you know, the risk on him. Uh, I still think he's a wild card, uh, you know, with all these flat earth stuff and everything else. Like, okay, it was vaccine stuff last season, uh, but What's going to be Could this it be season? Something, some yeah. other weird curveball coming through this season, uh, maybe. So he does get bumped down a little bit from where I think he's uh, like what, where his value lies, which I actually think is like pretty high up in the, oh, it's in the top um, seven or eight, I'd say uh, personally. Yeah, even yeah. higher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so once he's kind of once he's passing around pick eighteen or so, um, then I'm looking at him. Uh, but yeah, increasingly as we get closer to the season again, he's 
he's inching upwards as people so, kind of okay. do that calculation and think, oh, well, we're not in the middle of a, a pandemic as much anymore. Yeah, I think I think for me, like this second round, and it, it seems to always be this way, you get these, like especially the first half of the second round, you get these guys that are first round guys on a per game basis that are injury risks or um, just weirdness risks so in this round you've got Kyrie you've got Anthony Davis you've got Paul George you've got Kawhi Leonard like all these guys are there so of all of those guys yes Kyrie has not been the healthiest player but if we take the last sort of 12 months he has been the guy that hasn't actually had an injury it's been like you said the vaccination status and of all those guys he might I mean maybe outside of Anthony Davis he might have the highest upside Um, so for me there's a lot of landmines you've got to kind of dodge in that second round anyway. So I'm willing to bet on the guy that is, you know, quote unquote healthy at the moment. And so for me, that that's the reason. Maybe outside of like a Damian Lillard or a Halliburton, if they're in your second round, there's kind of like a clear top 13 or 14 to me. Outside of that, I'm, I'm willing to take the punt on, on Kyrie, assuming that I'm feeling confident with my first round pick. Like if you're, for example, not super keen on or, or confident with Steph and, and he's your first round guy, then maybe you, you let Kyrie slide. Or if you're not feeling confident with Durant, maybe you go somewhat a bit safer from there. But if I get a Tatum or something like that, absolutely, I'm, I'm really happy to take Kyrie and I could have two top 10 guys on my team. And I think you've got to, you've got to take those risks in drafts at some point and the payoff for him can be huge. The next yeah, guy, well, sorry, go on. I'll just add to that really briefly. Um, but the other, another kind of point to note with taking Kyrie is that, you know, like you've got Giannis and you've got, uh, and you've got Luca typically yep. going in that top three to five, which means obviously that you're going to be picking in the back end of the second round, pick kind of 19 to 24. That's a lot of the time where Kyrie is kind of falling to. Um, and if you've taken one of those two guys I mentioned before, you're, you're punting free throws most likely. Yeah. But then, Kyrie becomes kind of a pass on that basis. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I still might be willing to take the punt there, especially if I'm a Luca, because I think that that represents enough value that I might hedge my bets and, and change my strategies. It would depend on who else is on the board. For example, if Anthony Davis is there, I think he's probably a better option in that build. Um, it, it's hard to know because, like you said, the range on those kind of players is so wide on different leagues that, it's hard to know where he's going to go in your league. So I guess it's something that, yeah, make make your your own decision on and, and your own line and, and sort of just be prepared for anything with those guys to, to fall at any point. Um, let's talk about this next guy who's, um, at least in my anecdotal experience, he is surging up draft boards. Um, Anthony Edwards, ADP of 20.19. So um, in the second round, fairly comfortably now. Um is he someone who is rising recently as I kind of feel like he is in the mocks that I've done or, or is this going to, has this been here the entire off season? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's, it's, he's, he's been there like he is rising, but he has been high from the get go. Like, okay. Yeah. So first, I think the first draft only we did second round pick straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, which is a little bit of a surprise to me, but I think what people saw toward the end of, last season in particular was just him making giant leaps forward. I mean, I guess all across of last season and what they're baking in is uh, an idea that he's going to continue uh, on that trajectory. Um, So I don't, I think he finished about 40 last season off the top of my head, somewhere in that range. Um, So 44 in nine category. 44. So even taking out turnovers, maybe fraction, fraction higher from there, but yeah, I'm not typically personally taking people or players that are uh, like so much ahead of where they finished the season before. I'll leave that risk for other people. Um, but having said that, I do. I wouldn't be surprised if he does end up yep. in the in the top two rounds. Even in the, he could even be a round one player. Like the guy is a very good basketball player. Yeah, I, I definitely project. I think he's going to be the Minnesota Timberwolves' leading scorer this season. I think he'll take that mantle from Carthony Towns this year. Um, I think it is telling the fact that they went out and got a go bear in the off season. Um, I don't think that they would pull that trigger and, and give up the assets that they did if they didn't believe in someone like an Anthony Edwards. And I think that's that's a good sign of confidence from the organization and um, what he can produce. I just have a little bit of concern in terms of like taking him at his ceiling um, and not quite getting the value. You know, we'll mention another guy that's going to be 
a little bit later. Um, there are still guys at this draft spot that have first round value that have done it before, a bit more proven that I would probably rather take the risk on. But in saying that, he is pretty close to that turn of the, the second and third round for me. Um, and if you are really looking for your points, really looking for your threes um, early in drafts and, and, I think I think he can definitely do that. It's just the percentages, the the turnovers. I don't know if he's going to be like a, an elite rebounds or assists guy. They'll be fine. Um, it's just those other stats that maybe people focus on those points a lot that draws the eyes in there. So I think he's going a little bit earlier than I would like. I might even have someone like a Cade Cunningham, like slightly above him, who's another bit of a hype guy, but hasn't quite caught the same hype that Anthony Edwards has, just because I prefer the assists that he provides a little bit more securely. Um, but yeah, it is interesting to see that he is definitely catching a lot of uh, a lot of momentum at the moment. Uh, be interesting like to see... A- He's like a Luca in a sense. Like people just want to have him on their team. Because yeah, I can definitely see that. The fun factor is definitely there. Um, I'll, I'll quickly touch on this one. Um, I don't think we need to spend too much time on him, but Donovan Mitchell at 24.38. I'm assuming that this is a lot of the stuff before the trade, and I'd imagine that his draft stock is moving down since the trade to uh, Cleveland. Or, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he, so his draft stock marginally down, maybe okay. one or two spots. Um, personally with Donovan Mitchell, my like more historical sense with him is that it's kind of like what we were just discussing with Anthony Edwards. People have baked in a lot more growth every season for him than at what actually happens. You yeah. know, he's a exciting young player. People like watching him and they're assuming that he's going to make these leaps and bounds because, you know, he's, you know, he's great to watch on TV. Um, so he, typically is going like in that, uh, like that late second round, possibly early third round, um, you know, across the last several seasons, but he never really delivers on that. And I never really take him there. So I know people want like consistency. They want someone who can get a lot of points. They can get threes, good percentages and all that kind of stuff. Uh, But yeah, uh, Donovan Mitchell, uh, you know, particularly with the trade to uh, Cleveland, I think at that spot doesn't represent value to me. Yeah, so in a nine-category setting last year, he was the 26th-ranked player. So at 24, you're expecting him to do better than that. Um, He had a career-best year in steals, which I'm not confident enough to just say that he's going to repeat that again this year. And we know that that's a very volatile stat. And then, of course, moving to Cleveland... um, Whilst he'll still probably be the number one scorer on that team, he is now competing with Garland and Evan Mobley, where before he was unquestioned that number one guy. And, you know, it was the likes of Gobert and Conley in in those kind of spots. And it, yeah, I think he's unquestionably going to take a step back. Um, I think he's, yeah, closer towards the 30s, late third round for me. I think the points in threes are still valuable. Um, And and especially when you punt field goal percentage, he, he does take a step forward. But, yeah, I think that that would be a bit of a too, too high a spot for me. Um, this is where I would rather take an Anthony Edwards or a Cade Cunningham uh, instead, where they're kind of moving up whilst he's moving down. Uh, in my yeah, opinion. in other words, you're not getting him in any leagues this year. Yeah, I don't think so. It doesn't look that way. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on to these next two guys because I think this is very interesting. Um, two injured players that are obviously falling because of people's... Uh, Risk adverseness. Um, Kawhi Leonard at 33.5 and and Jimmy Butler at 33.9. In my experience, I've definitely seen Jimmy fall a lot further than a Kawhi, um, but this number really jumped out for me at 33.5. Kawhi's ranked kind of similar on a Yahoo um, system. Um, I was kind of expecting the number to be higher in in this kind of ADP data. Maybe it's influenced a little bit more at the start of the off-season when we were a bit more unsure. Um, What can you tell me about Kawhi's uh, ADP data change? Yeah, well, let me first say that I'd actually add one more player into that that mix, which is Brad Beal, which I think like he fits the same mold uh, as Jimmy and Kawhi. Uh, it's funny. So Kawhi, actually, when we first started um, draft only season, he was going way lower. So yeah, he right. was kind of, uh, yeah, he was third round. Like, I think I even saw him slide to the fourth round um, in one or two drafts. So I think it's the, you know, the recency bias where, you know, he's obviously missed the whole season. Mm-hmm. People kind of, uh, I guess, down on him or, uh, you know, fed up with him or thinking he's, you know, 
they they kind of forget how good he is because I haven't seen him play for so long. I guess that's yeah. that's where it's coming from. Uh, but yeah, he certainly has been um, like floating upward um, as you know more reports come out from uh, from from the clips that you know he's he's going to be ready to go, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, Kawhi can be a real game changer, like first round value potentially, uh, particularly on a per game basis. So you know, rationality is winning the day there. Um, on the flip side of that, um, you got Jimmy uh, who has been going late. Um, that like, that's obviously uh, like an average draft position. So in some cases he's going earlier. Yep. Uh, it's funny. Like there is a generational piece um, with drafting, right? So like your older, more grisly, um, you know, fantasy basketball participants, they're more inclined to take the older bets. Whereas you kind of younger guys uh, and, and ladies in some cases, uh, who uh, you know, um, you know, maybe early twenties or something like that. They're much more inclined to have like write those types of players off. Yeah. So I can, uh, you know, so Dan Bespris, uh, for instance, you know, has his old man squad. Like that's yeah. that's that uh, philosophy in a nutshell. You can get so much value off these old guys. Personally, um, with uh, with Jimmy, I'm not taking him this season. Uh, I. Don't really ever take him. Uh, he's a bit of an injury risk for me. I don't. I can't remember a season where he hasn't missed considerable amounts of time. I also think he's on the back end of the the age curve. And when we were when we were comparing, uh, when we were talking about Anthony Edwards before, uh, one thing I was going to say was, you know, when the players are younger, um, you know, they're on the good end of the upside downside curve. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah Jimmy's uh, even Kawhi to a certain degree. Um, and even, no, not quite so much with Bradley Beal, but yeah, those guys are certainly, um, uh, on the, on the, on the, on the downward trajectory. Yeah. They're, they're not, probably not going to have a, uh, well, I mean, unless your name is DeMar DeRozan, you're not going to have a career best year at this point in your, in your, um, NBA career. But I think, yeah, I think I'm obviously for me, Kawhi is definitely at this point represents a, a ton of value. I'm very, very, very happy to take him here. I'm very happy to take him in the second round. Again, similar to story to, to Kyrie. If I've got someone who is I feel safe with, I'm happy to take that punt. He's he's again a top ten guy on a per game basis. Um, we can we have the advantage of knowing when he's going to sit and rest games. So especially in a roto format, I know this is head to head data. In a roto format, he comes up a little bit higher for me. But in a head-to-head format, the, the only issue with Kawhi, like some of those other guys, though, is that we can kind of see a ceiling with him and know that, okay, they've got 15 back-to-backs in the season. We can already sort of take 15 games off Kawhi. And then it's also on top of that, if he gets injured, um, there's an extra element of risk. So I can see the rationale as to why he's fallen even further than some of those other injury-prone guys in the second round, like at Anthony Davis, Paul George, and Kyrie. But I still think that... He is just that good that you've got to take that swing, in my opinion, um, and, and, and it does represent really, really good value for me. Jimmy Butler, I kind of... winner of that pick, I think, with Kawhi. Like, if it all comes together, that that's got, that could win you your league. Like, could, if you're taking yeah. him in the third round, uh, yeah. for instance. Yeah, 100%. Like, that's that's just enormous value. And, and like we've sort of said in the past, like, the difference between a first-round player and a third-round player is the same difference between, like, a third-round guy and, like, a ninth or... Or, or something kind of player. Just the the way that the value kind of spreads out in the in the drafts gradually and gradually gets tighter and tighter between those late picks. Whereas these first guys really differentiate themselves from the rest of the pack. So it's enormous value getting him at this point. If he does miss only those fifteen to twenty games, I think it's still really really worthwhile. Um, Jimmy Butler for me, I've seen him fall very much in a lot of the mocks I've done. He's reached the forties in some drafts. I think that I'm I'm cooling a little bit on him. I'm everyone's kind of hesitancy is rubbing off on me a little bit, and I'll probably maybe bump him down my board in the next BallBoysNBA.com uh, update. But I still think that again, most teams at this point you're going to have like an injury risk in the first three rounds. There's just that many guys in the draft um, that are injury prone, so every team that's in your draft, I think will have an injury risk guy early on. And it's a bit of a lottery to who actually gets the luck and has their guy available in the playoffs, um, whether or not they injured at the start of the season. It's it's a bit of a toss up. Jimmy, you're not going to rely on him. I think that he's 
he's dropping because of that, but he was still like the 13th ranked guy last season uh, on a nine category basis. He did slow down as the season went on, which does concern me. And obviously I'd have him a few, you know, 15 or spots behind uh, a Kawhi for that reason. But yeah, I still think that if you can get him at like the mid thirties in, in the start of the fourth round, I'd be happy to take the swing there, but I do get the hesitancy for, for a guy like that. All right, let's move on to the next name here. We will talk about uh, Zion Williamson. Now, he's someone who I've had maybe some uh, differing thoughts to some of the other analysts out there from what I've heard. And I think I remember hearing you discuss him with uh, Adam King on one of your early mock drafts. I'm a bit down on Zion Williamson um, just for the reason that I feel like his... His value is very much concentrated in, in a couple of categories in his points and field goal percentage. He's listed here at 36.85, which if you just look at his ranking, it might it might be fine, and especially in a punt free throw percentage, he will probably rank a lot higher than this. Um, what are your thoughts on Zion, and do you think that this is a, a good spot for him to sort of go in a head-to-head league? And um, yeah, what, what do you think his value is to those punt free throw teams, and would you ever take him in a non-punt free throw kind of situation? Uh, yeah, well, Zion actually, in terms of players moving up draft boards, he's got some of the heaviest movement up. Right. So uh, he, particularly at the beginning of draft only season, uh, could have been, you know, fifth round uh, yep. is where you could be picking him up. Definitely um, ADP over 50 um, for the, over the first few drafts. And that's just been edging up and edging up and edging up. And um, I think just around the traps, he's starting to get a lot more buzz. Um, I think there's a lot of reports coming out that he's looking good. You know, he's looking cut. Um, He's uh, ready to go for the first day of the season. And I think a lot of the concerns about Zion really stem from, uh, you know, him kind of missing huge blocks of time. I know personally, like last season, for instance, I took him in a lot of drafts and that just killed my teams because I've yep. been taking him kind of second or third round. Um, so, yeah, for punt free throw teams, yeah, the guys like, you know, potential, he'll be top 12. He yeah, could be a first round guy. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So um, you, if you are taking a, if you are taking a, like a Giannis or something like that, grabbing Zion in the third round to me is like completely reasonable thing to do. Um I actually, I think I would probably have him kind of in that 25 to 30 range in terms of where I think he could really conceivably finish um, for the season. You know, he was, he's not that far removed from being a rookie. Um, He's still kind of um, quite young. He's still probably getting stronger um, and uh, refining his skills uh, on the basis that, you know, he's, you know, he's training and practicing, which we assume that he is. Um, so, yeah, I think there's still a lot of upside left with Zion. I mean, if you just think back to, like, how much he was hyped as a number one pick, you know, where he was getting Jordan shoe contracts and stuff before he'd even played a game. Um, sometimes that kind of hype can be wrong. Like, there's been numerous instances where number one picks have been busts. Um, but in many more cases, you know, um, there's been something to that hype. So I just don't think that we've seen peak Zion just yet. Uh, yep. And it, you know it's due to kind of happen uh, any day. Uh, another another thing is like you you asked me like would I take him in a non punt free throw build? Mm-hmm. Uh, again, there my answer is yes. I know that uh, this one isn't going to be necessarily from a place of you know following the data. Like if I look back at Zion's you know free throw history over you know the course of his NBA career and beforehand, he's not ever been a good free throw shooter. Uh, but maybe maybe I'm a bit uh, maybe it's a bit off for me to think this, but I do think that free throw percentage is an area that players can have dramatic improvements um, versus say other other areas of fantasy. So you're not necessarily going to go from uh, you know 12 points a game to 25 points a game very often. Uh, and similarly with free throw percentages, um, you know. The, uh, you can have a very, very low free throw percentage person getting kind of, you know, shooting one from two, something like that. And then they could make slight improvement or, you know, a, a, an improvement and that can shoot up to, you know, 70%, 75%. So I just think the guy's an athlete, he's good at basketball and maybe maybe that free throw does kind of come around. But in the meantime, you could be getting 30 points a game, um, you know, a double-digit rebounds potentially, 
could be getting multiple stocks. Um, so yeah, I like the, I like just that. I like what he brings to the table and uh, I think we haven't yet seen him put it all together. Like, there's no question denying his upside, and he's one of the best. I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that he's definitely deserving of that number one pick, and I think he's a is, is an animal. Like, he's one of, one of the best finishes at the rim I think we've ever seen in the league. Um, there's no questioning his NBA talent. I think from a fantasy point of view, there are a lot of things that have to go right for me to consider him... Um, to, to, to take him where I think he is going to be going. I think that when you're drafting him on a team that's already got uh, a Giannis, for example, let's say you take a Giannis and then you take uh, Rudy Gobert in the second round or something like that in a punt free throw build, which would make a lot of sense. Um, and then you pair a, a Zion Williamson with him in the third round. To me, the fact that you're doing that, your field goal percentage is so far and away way more dominant than any other team in your league that the value of taking Zion Williamson there is is less because you can only win your field goal percentage by one. I mean, you don't get extra points for being 20% over the, the team you're versing. So for me, I mean, the points are excellent. He's going he's gonna to get close to 30 points a night. We, we expect the assist to maybe come up a little bit to maybe close to five per game. I might push back on the double-digit rebounds there. I don't know if he's going to be getting that many rebounds. And the stocks were there in college, but we haven't seen it yet in the NBA. So it's a possibility, but I don't know if I want to be banking on it. And then you also have the injury risk. So I'm more inclined to to pair him with like a Luca pairing if I started with that and, and my field goal percentage is an area that I need to address and I'm still looking to punt those free throws. Um, so in that build, I can definitely see him as a third-round pick if I'm feeling pretty safe with my first couple. Um, because the upside, like you said, is enormous. And in that build, he definitely has that value there when you when you need his field goal percentage. But when you don't need his field goal percentage, the rest of the stat lines, at least so far, have been pretty empty. Um, and you compare that, you pair that with the injury risk. And, uh, and I'm probably just going to not end up on, with Zion on a lot of my teams um, so far because I think the hype, like you said, he's rising in boards, and I think it's going to get to a point where I'm not going to get him very often. So, I mean, before the injury last season, I was having him in the second round, but foot and guys of his size, it, it just a lot of red flags, and the and the communication from the Pelicans didn't sound encouraging. Um, so, just a little bit, a little bit wary of that. But uh, of course, he is a he is a beast and an animal. So, let's move on to the next couple of guys. We're going to go through a couple of hype dudes, some younger players that are coming into their second season. Alperen Sengun at 59 or 60, uh, and Josh Giddy at 61. Um, two guys that I think are obviously very talented. Some of them are getting a little bit too high up there for me in terms of hype. I think Shengun might still represent a little bit of value here, but it's, in my opinion, I saw him go 47th, I think, in a mock I did the other day. It's, it's starting to get a bit too uh, rich for my blood. What, what are your thoughts on these young guys? Um, and are, are they moving up in, in the data you're seeing? Uh, yeah, well, I think, well, with Sengun, uh, he's been way up there pretty much since the, the draft only stuff kicked off. Um, just the spot that he's in on, in Houston, it's very attractive yep. to people. Uh, personally, he hasn't ended up on a single one of my teams. Um, I, again, I think at that, around that spot, you're drafting almost for, not for ceiling. I think his ceiling could actually be a little bit higher than yeah. that, but you're assuming huge change. To a lot of things way. would have to go his way to get there. Yeah, correct. And, and then I'll, I think this next comment applies for Giddy uh, as well. You know, the, the value that they're generating comes from them being on, you know, not very good teams. Uh, and getting a lot of minutes on those not very good teams. But then it, sometimes you need to remember or you need to consider, like, how how good are these guys as actual players at this stage? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah Sangoon could be a like a statistics machine, same with Giddy. But they're, they're also going to make mistakes because they're yeah. not really that, you know, top echelon NBA player just yet. So... They, they're going to get benched for stuff, you know, like, you know, not running the not running the plays properly or, you know, foul trouble, just kind of that rookie mindset type stuff where they're still maturing and learning the game. So just to assume that they're going to come in and run like, you know, 33, 34 minutes a night, I think that's probably uh, an error. I think yeah. another thing is on those young teams is like, 
those coaches have got liberty to mix and match and play around with their lineups. And yep. they're going to go through periods where they're giving other kind of systems a whirl or maybe, you know, trying to get Sangoon to play a bit more pick and pop or, you know, something like that. It's going to be not just your consistent end of last season um, yep. stat lines, I don't think. So yep. but both those guys, yeah, I'm not... I haven't really ended up with them on any drafts. So just switching over to Giddy, I think, uh, yeah, love his stat set. Obviously, the field goal percentage is a concern, but for the right build, that's that's great. Um, I'd be – I like – you know, it's pretty difficult to get assists. Up. You know, you need to kind of rack them up early in your draft. So Giddy does get a little bit of height and value because um, he's giving you those assists in those mid-rounds. Uh, if you can absorb the the field goal percentage, but again, you know, I think as attractive as he is, uh, if he's playing thirty five a night, I do think, yeah, again on OKC, they're going to be trying different things. They're going to be letting ball handling uh, fall to the responsibility of some of the others. Obviously, Shea is going to be doing a bit of it. Um, you know, there's going to be uh, other guards behind those two in the rotation that will get a bit of um, get a bit bit of run. So, yeah, I'm not anticipating getting giddy in a lot of leagues as well because the the hype machine's really in action and yeah he's kind of in that zone where I think it's a little bit too high versus you know where you're likely to get value from the pick so I'd probably go in a different direction there I also think it's funny that like a someone like a Shea Gilch Alexander is experiencing like the opposite of hype because of he's on the OKC Thunder and he's going to get shut down at the end of the season, but Giddy is getting all the hype because he's on the OKC Thunder and he's going to get all the minutes. So it's like pick it's pick and choose the logic that you're going to apply, and I, I feel as though um, one is getting the logic applied to him, whereas the other one is getting the exact opposite. So um, just just something that I find interesting. I'm not not sure which is right or wrong, but um, one that I find very interesting. And and you were saying before about those guys not being the best players yet. Like we saw it last season with Lamelo Ball, and we know how good he is, but even he was sometimes benched by the coach by doing dumb things. He he still only played 32 minutes a night, even though they didn't really have much of a backup point guard to sort of take him off. He, he was... He was good, but maybe not as good as as what you would hope. Um, and I think Shengun especially might be in that kind of uh, risk of... I, I personally feel shaky projecting him any more than 30 minutes a night. I, I probably would take the conservative approach and guess that he'd be about 28 minutes. Um, and, and sort of anything else on top of that is a bonus. And, and I can be pleasantly surprised from there. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, you know, that's for that exact reason, I'm liking Shea at the back end of that yeah. second round and quite often, like, closer to pick 30. Yeah, he, he's right. falling yeah. for, for lots of different reasons. So, yeah, shout out to Shea. Um, let's go on. I want to talk about some rookies now and just where they're going and, and sort of get your thoughts on them. Uh, Paolo Boncaro is the first rookie picked in most situations at 64.96 or 65. Um, Jabari's going close to pick 86. And then Keegan Murray close to pick 90 or 91. Um do you think that this, in your opinion, does this reflect where you think that they should go or do you think there's a bit of value in one more than the other? And, um, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on drafting rookies in, in general? Uh, well, I tend to agree with you that um, Jabari could end up being the, the best yep. rookie fantasy performer. Uh, I also think Keegan Murray is going to most likely put together a pretty good season. He seems very NBA-ready. Um, so I think Paolo's a bit high uh, at 65. He hasn't ended up on any of my teams. Uh, Jabari was representing value maybe like a month ago, but now that uh, I think more analysts are talking about, um, you know, his stat profile and stuff, he's getting up there. You know, Apologies. The 80- yeah, that's yeah, yeah. I was talking about you. Um, so his ADP there is eighty six, but before, like when we started drafting, he was going one hundred, hundred and ten, yeah. hundred and fifteen. So he's actually going higher than that. Um, you know, to pull that, he's actually going in like the late sixties, early seventies now. Yeah. So um, I'm not on board uh, necessarily with. I'm yet to take him in a single league. Okay. Keegan Murray, on the other hand, I actually got quite a lot of stock in yeah. Keegan Murray. I was really impressed with his summer league. I watched a few of those games and um, I think he's going to start for um, Sacramento. And uh, yeah, he just looks like a proper player. So um, I'm thinking that um, even at, at that around that 90 spot, that's probably starting to get a bit too early for Keegan. Uh, but he is, 
like he, with with Keegan particularly, you know, his draft slot's a lot more variable than the other two. He doesn't have quite yeah. the same yeah. amount of height. So he does tend to fall a little bit. And if he's getting outside the top 110 uh, and it's my pick, um, you know, I'm taking him in quite a few different build styles. Yeah, I think he, he he's someone you can draft inside the top 100, although I wouldn't go too crazy. I think in the, the last mock I did, it was a roto mock, and Keegan went at like 57 or something like that, which was just absolutely crazy, um, in my opinion. But he went before both Palo and Jabari. So there's always going to be guys that you know maybe rate one more than the other. But to me, I, I still think that Jabari represents a little bit of value, probably more so if you're punting the field goal percentage. Um so I still I still really do like him, um, but I agree with you that at sixty five, Palo is probably a bit too bit too high for me. I know his points and rebounds, and assists are nice, but the lack of the other stats are a bit of a concern. Um, yeah, I think he's just going to get that number one rookie hype that a lot of guys do, and uh, it's a shame that Chet is not going to be on this list this year. Uh, we'll be watching him for next year. Uh, moving along to some other younger guys, some Spurs players that I wanted to highlight here. Uh, we've got uh, Keldon Johnson at an ADP of 67 and Devin Vassell at an ADP of about 78. Um, what are your thoughts on, I guess, we're expecting these two guys to be the ones that benefit from DeJounte Murray's uh, absence there. Um, do you think that the ADP here is about where they should be going or, or do you like one more than the other? Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the Spurs situation? Yeah, so I think, um, I actually think this ADP is probably uh, a little bit l- uh, lower than where, where they should probably be. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, so again, uh, these guys have been moving up draft boards. We actually started doing these uh, draft onlys uh, before the trade um Took place, right? So okay. obviously they were less value, less valuable at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then again, to kind of balance that out, they're actually going a little bit higher than these ADPs indicate, right. but not right. not that much. I'd say maybe five slots higher than this. Yeah. Uh, which in both instances, particularly in Vassell's instance, yeah, I think that's still value. Um, I think that's still value. So. I mean, I uh, like you know it was easy to see what the like the implications of of Murray moving to Atlanta would be that these guys were going to get a lot more run. So I was being kind of interested in both of these guys um, since we started doing the draft onlys, and I was able to kind of uh, you know in the for the first half a dozen or so, I was able to pick them up at, at good value. Maybe Vassell in the in the nineties, the eighties, um, and uh, Calden. Uh, yeah, he's certainly been going a little bit higher than Bissell, but like the seventies, the eighties. Um, but that that quickly kind of disappeared as other people latched onto the implications of that trade. Uh, people are people are going for those uh, those those two players earlier and earlier. Um, and I guess I've just been a little bit behind the eight ball, uh, expecting them to fall further than they do, and then continually disappointed when they don't. So. I do expect that they're going to keep shooting up the draft boards and I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, by the time October rolls around that, you know, they could both be getting, you know, ADPs in the fifties. And then in that case, I think it's kind of still fine to take them in and around that spot, but you're not getting the same value as you, as you would have been once upon a time. Yeah, I think um, for me, Vassell still represents a lot of value. I, I actually think I prefer him over Keldon Johnson in a lot of situations. Um, just feel a bit more secure with his defensive stats and um, like three-point shooting a little bit more. Um, Keldon probably score more points, which often gravitates a lot of people's eyes and we sort of focus on that a lot. But I think Vassell just gives me a little bit more. And I think obviously if you can get him a bit later, I'm more interested there. Um, the field goal percentage is obviously not the best, but especially in the punt field goal percentage builds, I think he's someone who could definitely finish inside the top 50. I don't think I'd draft him, you know, inside the top 60 because you're cutting out a lot of value there. But yeah, anytime it gets outside pick 60, I'm, I'm usually pretty happy to, to have a look at both of these guys. So if they're available there, I think that's about the right sort of value for me. Um, I wanted to really quickly touch on this. We don't want to, have to spend too long on it, but Miles Bridges, um, he's obviously a very unique case um, for fantasy basketball people to consider. I've had a couple of questions about people saying like, what's what's the go? Do we know that he's out for the season? I, I'm assuming that he is going to be out for the entire season, suspended or whatever the case may be. He's been selected at 99, um, but only in eight of the 26 drafts that have happened over with you guys, um, 
in all the mock drafts I've done so far, I'm pretty sure he's gone undrafted. Um, I personally just don't want the guy on my team. I don't think he's going to play any games. So, um, yeah, what are your quick thoughts on Miles Bridges and, and, and the ADP data that you're seeing? It's funny. It's... Um it's become one of those etiquette issues rather than a right. like a, like an analysis or a fantasy issue yeah. where it's like ah oh, well you know he's not a, he's not a nice bloke so i don't want to have anything to do with him it's yeah. kind of yeah. more of a statement than like trying to win your league or whatever um i guess i early on before this narratives about like you know not talking about him on pods and not drafting him and stuff started propagating um, he was certainly getting drafted a lot lower um, in the draft onlys, um, you know, typically like a last round, second last round, third last round, which, right. you know, if you took the emotion out of it, like that's a great pick. Yeah. In, you know, I mean, taking a pick 14, pick 13, uh, and then he did come back and you're getting like a second round guy uh, or first round guy potentially. Um, not that I do think he'll come back and do that, but, um, you know, that could be, again, lead winning pickup type of stuff. Um, I actually grabbed him in that round 14 in, in, you know, three or four, five drafts. I haven't been doing it more recently, but I guess the, the, the thing that I think about with this particular issue is like, oh, well, what are the use cases where, where has this type of thing happened before? You know, Darren Collison or, uh, in the NFL, there's some, um, some, uh, some shady behavior taking place as well. And then you look at the punishment that's dished out to those players as a result of uh, the same kind of thing that Miles Bridges did. Albert, uh, I think Miles's case might be more severe than some of these others. Um, but they're getting like, you know, I think Collison was like an eight game suspension. Yeah. Uh, I think um, the guy in the NFL was like missed, missed four, four games, like four weeks worth of games. Um, so that's, that's not much like two weeks, four weeks, you know? So he's still, you know, I, I don't think that the Hornets just like cut him. Uh, I think he's, you know, maybe he's on the qualifying offer. He's, he's still going to be around. Um, but like, I think there is a scenario where he gets a severe punishment, but that severe punishment could be right. You're suspended for 25 games. Yeah. I mean, look yeah. at Deandre Ayton, you know, something else that people don't really talk about, but, you know, the performance-enhancing drug issue. Right, in his, yeah. He got 25 for that, I think, from memory. Yeah, 25. And that, yeah. that like, that's a pretty serious breach it is. of... yeah. Um, and then, like, it, there'd be people listening to this podcast who don't even remember that, you know, because it was kind yeah. of all, like, swept under the table kind of thing. And we're kind of in that phase with Bridges now. Like, no one's talking about it, kind of waiting for it to like fall from recent memory. And like, I just wouldn't be surprised if we get some kind of announcement, maybe around the time the season's starting. And like, you know, there's a lot of other narratives that are around and it's like, all right, you know, he's got a, you know, 30 game suspension or something like that. In which case, if he's, if he's sitting on the back of your bench, um, you put him in your IR or whatever. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough one because at the time of recording, we don't have all the information. Um, I don't know when that information is going to be, um, you know, coming out. I think that, like, right now he's not signed anywhere. He's just sitting out there in free agents or, or yeah, he's obviously a restricted free agent with the, the Hornets at the moment. So it's a tough one. It, it's for a much different reason. It reminds me of, like, Kyrie Irving last year. We kind of just had no idea what to do with him. Like, the, the rules were changing as we were discussing um, what his draft value would be. Um, like you said, if you take the emotion out of it, like, besides your personal point of view on the vaccination status and that sort of stuff, um, Kyrie Irving won a lot of people their leagues last year because he came back for the fantasy playoffs. He dominated, um, was a top five guy in, in those kind of leagues. And and if you got him in the ninth, tenth round, like, well, there you go. That's just an amazing value. Um, so... It's it's a tough one. I, I haven't spoken much about it on on the the podcast thus yet. I haven't been drafting him because I think that the NBA is very um, uh, forward thinking on these kind of topics and and these kind of issues. And I think that um, Adam Silver especially wants to you know uh, doesn't want this to become you know a, a media thing or a bad PR kind of thing for him. So I think that the punishment will be quite severe, more severe than we've seen in things like the NFL. But for me, yeah, it's just, 
it's it's hard to sort of say anything with much evidence to back it up because the the information is still coming out and we, we don't really have a precedent to fall back on for this type of thing. So those are my thoughts on Miles Bridges. You probably won't see me drafting him any, any mock drafts um, until we get further information or, or something changes. So um, yeah, a bit of a tough one, but just thought one that I would bring up because I haven't spoken much about on the podcast to this point. Um, last uh, one I wanted to really just quickly touch on, Isaiah Jackson is a player that I'm having a really hard time figuring out where I'd be happy to draft him. And um, in this, uh, this data is telling us that he's at ADP of 105. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on which way that's moving backwards or forwards. I know in the Yahoo, AD, uh, Yahoo rankings adjustment, he's been moved up to 85, which for me is feeling too high. Um, it's a big swing for someone who's at the moment a backup center who's going to be playing like 16 to 18 minutes a night at best. Um, what are your thoughts on Isaiah Jackson and where's he moving in terms of his range? Yeah, I, I haven't got him in any non-dynasty leagues. Got him in a lot of dynasty leagues. Me too, in, I love him. Uh, yeah, yeah, but not in any non-dynasty leagues because of this reason. Like, he's not, doesn't have a clear, like, starting role uh, in Indiana. He's not necessarily going to get the minutes people kind of potentially expecting. You got... Dadze is still there. You've got um, you've got uh, Smith. You've got um, Miles Turner hasn't been traded yet. You know, like oh, you know, there's a lot of buzz. He's gonna he's gonna get moved somewhere, but it's been that buzz for you know three years, yeah. uh, and he's still there. So um, you know, I I'm pretty much expect that he's gonna be getting kind of like 20, 22 minutes a game, something like that. Um, some games he'll play more matchup dependent. Some games will play less. Uh, he could be fouling out sometimes. He does get a few fouls. So, uh, yeah, I think people are buying the hope. They're having a bit too much hopium, uh, with, uh, with Ajax at that, at that spot. Um, yeah, if he's falling outside my top 10, 11 picks yeah. and it's like, it's upside flyer time, then yeah, party time for me. I was taking. Yeah. But otherwise, no. Nah. Yeah, he. There's just there's still guys around that point of view. Like I, I'm pretty sure in every mock draft I've done so far, Gordon Hayward is still available at like 105. Um, I know there's risk associated with him, but you know he's going to be there at the start of the season. He's going to get the minutes. He's been a top 50 guy before, so I'd much rather take that kind of a swing. Using him as an example, I think there are still players like that available at that spot. Um, like you, like he's. He was 98th in nine category leagues um, last year in 21 minutes a night after the All Star break, which is great. He'll still be worth drafting, and I absolutely love him at you know pick 115, 120. Love him there because he's on your bench. You're taking that upside swing, and he can still be worthwhile drafting for the blocks and field goal percentage that he'll give you. But yeah, just that little bit earlier, I think you're you. you starting to talk yourself into a scenario that might not eventuate. Like, they literally signed DeAndre Ayton in the offseason or tried to sign him. So they're not viewing him as a guy that, oh, we've got our center. Like, let's let's stop looking for centers because uh, we've got Isaiah Jackson. Like, they could literally trade Miles Turner for DeAndre Ayton at the trade deadline. And all the time you've been stashing him and he's been the 140th ranked player, well, see you later. He's still going to be that guy. He's still going to be a backup and you've kind of wasted that pick. So... I love him. I've got like like you. I've got a lot of dynasty leagues. I think he's a good player and he's a great permanent guy. But I think we might just be getting a little bit excited um, in redraft leagues so far. Um, yeah, so I think that might do it for us um, for today's podcast. Let us know again where we can find you, uh, B Dub, and what you guys have going on over at Fantasy Basketball International. And uh, yeah, give yourself a bit of a plug. Oh, cheers, mate. Um, so yeah, you can all the all our information is at fbibasketball.com. Uh, the key thing you want to look out for there is the link to our Discord server. That's where all the action's happening. Um, been running these draft onlys, uh, you know, for the last three four months. Um, we've been doing all our dynasty off season stuff, which has been keeping us busy as well. So you know, all the rookie drafts, a few dynasty like dynasty startups, uh, and all that kind of thing. Um, but now we are really on the cusp of, uh, redraft season. So, um, I've been setting up all the leagues, uh, which, uh, there's going to be hundreds of them 
this season um, of all different types of uh, uh, styles and buy-ins. So you're going to have your head-to-heads, your roto. There'll be some points leagues, mostly going to be slow snake drafts because our you know our members are all over the world and that's yep. the best way to facilitate that. Uh, but we will have a couple of auctions. There will be some like big money leagues this year because I get a lot of requests for for higher stakes uh, fantasy basketball than what I typically have been offering. Um, but then there's also like quite a plethora of like lower stakes leagues for kind of beginners and 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 uh, and that kind of thing. So everything up from free all the way up to I don't know what the the high stakes league could be a thousand bucks or something like that um, ahead. Uh, all the scoring and stuff is like what you would consider to be standard, no like, like weird um, categories or strange things that you wouldn't expect. Um, so, yeah, now is pretty much the time to go over to fbibasketball.com, join the Discord, uh, because going to start dropping all of those league information and so on um, over the next week or two. And then the, uh, the final thing that I'll mention is the Fantasy Basketball World Cup. Uh, which we run every year. Um, it's kind of, uh, you know, three, 400 teams, um, depending on, on the way that we set it up. Um, and uh, with one ultimate winner um, with some pretty cool prizes, including a signed NBA player jersey this year. Last year, we, we gave the winner an NBA jersey signed by Giannis. Um, this year, we're going to have another one. I'm not sure who the player is just yet, but yeah, come and check it out. Basically, if you want to have good quality leagues and not waste your time, then FBI is the place for you. Yeah, I, I can definitely endorse this one. Um, I've been a part of the... I, I joined the Discord server uh, a couple of years ago and have been enjoying my time since then. Uh, you've, you can find a lot of leagues that are hard to organize, including like your 30-team deep leagues. Um, I'm a part of a 30-team real NBA salary league, which is something that I hadn't had much experience in and wanted to, to you know get my feet wet with that kind of a, a draft and um, yeah, you get really good competitive managers over there. It's a good community. So definitely recommend that one for everyone who's looking for leagues to join and want to want to verse other capable fantasy managers. Uh, that will do it for us today, guys. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel. Give the video a big thumbs up. Um, if you want to check out our, our guide as well, head over to ballboysnba.com. Subscribe for 10 bucks over there and we'll see you guys next time. Laters.